Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be with you. How many of you are here today? Uh, so, uh, I guess it's my fellow Baptists that can't raise their hand. Uh, but, uh, I want to start off by showing you a trailer of a movie that um, my organization, Homes for Legal Defense Association, just put out on the Common Core. Uh, it's getting a lot of rave reviews. The Heritage Foundation just sent out a promotion of our movie uh, nationwide yesterday. Uh, the whole thing has been released about eight, eight or nine days right now. It's called uh, commoncoremovie.com is the website. But we'll just play, play the trailer. So put, These are 45 states that have voluntarily come together yeah, right. to create fewer, higher, deeper standards. They're world class. The five people who didn't agree to sign the letter simply were expunged from the record. The real issue in American education is that people without a whole lot of experience are dictating education policy. I'm trying to think of something analogous to this that slipped through so easily on a national basis. I really can't. Is the most meaningful reform of our public schools in a generation. Throw away their local candidates. And so I think just being straightforward and trying to tell the truth is very important. We had to sign a confidentiality agreement that we would not ever discuss what took place in the meeting itself. Against Common Core's controversial race to the middle. The biggest misconception that Common Core proponents push on people is that there is any evidence that a system like Common Core will benefit children. To do education reform right, you need standards, but you also need greater credentials. And I think the best argument for this the Common Core are the standards themselves. It takes power from the parent, it de incentivizes the parent from a deep and abiding interest in their child's education. Maryland parent. Was arrested last week yeah. speaking out about Common Core. Don't no stand for this. Fine, you're sitting here like hell. You got a person who's just They don't know how. They're not accountable to the public. What is the best case scenario? <clears throat> <laughs> it's got a buffering problem. We'll just let it go with that. Um, it is, I have another reason for being very proud about this movie. It's created by a young man named Ian Reed, who's a graduate of Patrick Henry okay. College. And he's, he's done a great job on it. And this, it's, it's free, available on the internet to anybody who wants it. Please promote it to all your friends. It is uh, presented in a way that shows both sides arguing their case. But when you watch it, the, the opposition to Common Core is so much more sensible than those that are promoting it. There's no doubt left behind. But because it does allow both sides to talk, it, it convinces people that are in the middle that this is the, the, the dangerous program. If you come across this all on one side, sometimes you won't win the people that want to hear, hear both sides. This is very well done, very effective. Uh, and you will make good use of it. Now I want to transition from Common Core to Article 5 and explain something to you. How does the federal government get the authority to do something like Common Core or No Child Left Behind or anything like that? all of these federal education programs? And Common Core is the worst of the lot, but it's not the first program like this. We have been having federal interference in education for a long, long time. And, and so the, the methodology, the constitutional methodology that this is proceeding under needs to be understood because if we really want to defeat Common Core, we, you know, we can defeat this particular version of this evil idea, or we can take away their ability to ever do this to, to us again. And I'm more interested, I want to defeat Common Core. I mean, I mean, I think the evidence that the organization has put out the premier movie about it to help defeat it. We also have a, a great publication, a 36-page document, uh, written by another one of my former students um, on the Common Core. If you go to hslda.org backslash Common Core, you can find a wealth of information. So we're dedicated and doing something to fight this particular iteration. But I'm even more interested 
and chopping off the head of the snake entirely and prevent the federal government from ever doing this to us again. So how do they do it? It's a misuse of the general welfare clause. And all you really need to know about the, the correct meaning of the general welfare clause is this. It was found in the Articles of Confederation. And when you translate the general welfare clause from the Articles of Confederation over to the Constitution, the absolute correct way to interpret this, it meant the same thing in both places. And you, you all know, you don't have to know hardly any American history at all to know that the Articles of Confederation did not give Congress any implied powers at all, much less the implied power to spend money on any cool project they want. But the interpretation of the, of the General Welfare Clause by the Supreme Court, starting in the case of United States versus Butler in the 1930s under Comrade Roosevelt's Agricultural Adjustment Act. I'm not really a big fan of FDR. I call him Comrade Roosevelt to distinguish him from other Roosevelt's. Uh, under, under Comrade Roosevelt's uh, Agricultural Adjustment Act, we got our major interpretation of the General Welfare Clause which meant Congress, and, and today it means this, Congress can spend money on any fool thing it wants. Another way of saying it is just this, there is absolutely no current enforceable constitutional limitation on the power of Congress to tax and spend. None. That's the interpretation of the Supreme Court. That's not what the General Welfare Clause was, was designed to do. It's not what the Constitution originally means. And it highlights the problem. We have effectively in this country two constitutions. We have the Constitution as written, and we have the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court. And if we're going to effectively change this country, we've got to be able to eliminate the Supreme Court's ability to interpret the Constitution according to their own whims. We have to be able to correct their misinterpretations and take away their power to make this problem again in the future. That's the objective. And once you understand the, the problem, what a constitutional lawyer, if you really, I mean, a lot of people call themselves constitutional lawyers these days. Uh, if they've gone to law school and they've held a, a constitution in their hands sometimes, they call themselves a constitutional lawyer. Somebody who really does this and has done it for a long time, what you've done is you've battled the government in court day in, day out for a long time and you're litigating against the government. The only organization I ever sue or defend against is the government, whether that's a state government, a local government, or the federal government. I only fight against the government. Why is that? Because the Constitution, by its definition, only controls the government. No private person can ever violate the Constitution because the government is controlled by the Constitution. Private people are not controlled by the Constitution because the Constitution has one purpose, grant government power, limit government power. That's it. And it is only about the government. So constitutional litigators have a track record, a long history, of fighting against the government. And when you teach constitutional law, you become effectively a structural engineer for government. Because the Founding Fathers understood that the correct processes for decision making are more likely to come out with the right answers for liberty. If you want to have protections of liberty, you're going to have to have good decision making processes. That's why we have separation of powers, at least we're supposed to have separation of powers. That's why we have federalism, because we knew, the founders knew, if you structure government by putting too much power in any one place, you're not going to have liberty. When you divide up decision-making authority so that one unit of government decides this, another unit of government decides that, and it takes these different branches of government to get to a decision on going to war, then governments are supposed to be checks and balances and limited because they understood that the heart of man was sinful and you could not trust sinful men with too much power anywhere, and so they wanted to have checks, balances, limitations, structure, power, and we have, it was engineered really well. A couple little minor tweaks like the treaty power. We could probably fix the treaty power and make it just a little bit better because frankly they changed the definition of the treaty. But basically 99% of it, the structure that the federal government was given in the, in the original constitution is absolutely sound structural engineering. But 
the function of the government today as interpreted by the Supreme Court is no structure at all. It is an unworkable system, and we have got to fix it. After the last election in November uh, of 2012, I basically said, our country is broken in, in Washington, D.C., will never, ever, 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 ever fix itself. And Common Core being an example. They take the general welfare clause. They steal money from the taxpayers of the state. They give it to the Department of Education who writes up these grant proposals. The grants get given back to the, to the states, and the, and the states are told, make your education policy match our federal mandates if you want the money that we took from your taxpayers. Actually, they really didn't take it from the taxpayers. They took it from the unborn people that are going to be the taxpayers someday. So they stole it from our, our children and grandchildren. I have, I have 17 grandchildren and uh, 10 children, so I have, a, you know, I, have, I have a big stake in the future of this country. Other people call it a family reunion, we call it a precinct caucus. Um, and so I don't want the federal government to have the power to dictate to the states through this utterly illicit use of the general welfare laws. I want to take away the power to do that. Well, there's only one way, effectively, to take over or to change these problems. The Supreme Court has 30 times said there is no effective check on our power except our own sense of self-restraint. That's not effective checks and balances, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever checks and balances the founders thought they put in place for the uh, Supreme Court are not working. They're simply not working. And if we're going to stop this runaway power, we have no choice but to take this head on at its source, and the source is the Supreme Court of the United States. And we have to understand that we can't fiddle around the edges with this. So when I was arguing a case, in fact, I, I'm one of the few lawyers in the country who's actually argued a case against the federal government on the misuse of the Article 5 process. And so, I am an experienced Article 5 litigator. There are about 10 of us in the country that can say that, well, assuming the others are still alive. I was very young when, when this case was going on. I was, uh, I looked like I was 18, but I was 31 or something. Um, and I was representing Washington State legislators. And in that case, the, the man who represented the Idaho legislators in the same case, and who was 20 years older than me or something like that, he was a really good guy. He had once talked to, um, a very famous conservative law professor from the University of Texas. And he said, when you're fighting a king, you can't wound him. You must kill him. And so if we think we can win this battle by wounding the king, by a little slice here, a little slice there, or, you know, we, we try to, you know, I'm going to use the term, we nullify this or nullify that, little battles, you know, skirmishes here and there, we're not going to win. We've got to take dead aim at the, problem, at the source of the problem and fix it. So, the only way to make that happen is outside of Washington, D.C. There is a power cabal in Washington, D.C. Congress is in love with their own power. The Supreme Court is in love with its own power. The White House is in love with its own power. They're all stealing power from each other at times, but they've got a gentleman's agreement that they're not going to mess with each other too much because they're collectively stealing power from the states and the people. And so as long as they cooperate with each other, they can, they can accumulate power. And they don't want to get in too many turf warfares between themselves. And so it is really, truly, a question of Washington, D.C. against everybody else. It is in the self-interest of every elected state official to fight Washington, D.C. And it is certainly in the interest of every American citizen to fight Washington, D.C. Because when you, whenever you're making a decision, only one person can make a final decision. Either Washington, D.C. is going to make a final decision, your state government is going to make the final decision, or the individual is going to make the final decision. And when this country is arranged correctly, and we're talking about domestic issues, the number one source of decision making needs to be the individual. Second place, in a, in a limited way, should be the states. Third, the federal government should have almost no jurisdiction whatsoever on domestic issues. They can run the patent office, 
they can run the Mint, uh, post office. the post office, very limited things. Yeah, very limited things. The Department of Labor needs to close and go home. I'd like to turn it into condoms. Uh, by the way, my office used to be across the street from the Department of Labor. They have a mural inside the Department of Labor called Building America. There are at least 150 OSHA violations in the mural. If the EPA had been in place, or the, excuse me, the, the OSHA had been in place when we were building America, America would have never got built in the first place. Uh, you know, it would be a wonderful place for condos. When people want to come and see the cherry blossoms, they can stay in the Department of Labor Hotel. Um, you know, the Department, of, the Department of Commerce needs to close. We can keep the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. That's necessary. I don't want, I, I think we can keep NASA. That's fine. But there are very, very, very few limitations for uh, uh, domestic programs. So the domestic decision making in this country needs to be individuals, a limited role for the states, and virtually no role for the federal government. That's how it's intended, and that's what we can do. And there's only one way we can do that, and that's through the state level. What are effective weapons for the states to do? Let's take the idea of nullification, because that's being bannered about by people who claim that they know what they're doing. I've never seen them fighting in the courts. I've never seen them uh, when I was opposing and successfully killing the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, they weren't on the field, they weren't helping, I don't know who they are, they claim to be experts, you, you decide. But, let's try the issue of nullification of the national debt. How in the world does the state legislature in, in Florida think that it can nullify the national debt? Can't do it. There's no conceivable path to do that. There's no conceivable path for the legislature of the state of Florida to nullify the NSA spying on American citizens. How are we going to do that? There, you, can't even, you can't even construct a model for how that would work, even in theory. Let's assume that the federal courts will leave you alone, which they will not do. And you're basically going to, you know, even if you could nullify something, the federal courts will rule it unconstitutional, and you're going to have to decide whether your state will take its militia and go to war over the issue. Because it will boil down to a shooting battle. Now, if we're talking about something like the, federal, the state of Florida not taking the federal money on the Common Core, and therefore not having any obligation to do it, you can do that. That's fine. They just steal the taxpayers' money from Florida still, and you can't stop them from doing that. Uh, the state of Oklahoma had, had one guy introduce a bill, a nullification bill on Obamacare. Here's the idea. The idea was that if any uh, Oklahoma citizen would refuse to join Obamacare and got fined, the state of Oklahoma would refund the money that they got fined by the federal government. I said, so you're going to have the taxpayers of Oklahoma refund the money that the federal government took from these people? No, 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 no. we're going to take it from the federal money. I said, well, how are you going to do that? Well, Oklahoma is ob obligated to pay certain, they collect excise taxes from the federal government, and we're going to seize those excise taxes. I said, okay, well and good, but here's what's going to happen. The federal courts are going to issue a, a levy order against the bank accounts owned by the state of Oklahoma, and they're going to go get the taxes from you. Then what are you going to do? There's no answer to that. There's no way that a state like Oklahoma or any place else can nullify an Obamacare penalty because unless we're willing to actually go to war, physical fighting war over these kinds of things, it won't work. And it, you know how many laws need to be nullified? The entire Code of Federal Regulations, 200 volumes of the Code of Federal Regulations, every single one of them are unconstitutional. There's, I don't know how many thousands of laws, my best guess would be something in the order of 10 to 15,000 laws in the Code of Federal Regulations. But there's, let's just take these 2,000. 2,000 laws, 50 states, 2,000 laws. That's 100,000 legislative enactments just to nullify the Code of Federal Regulations. And as soon as you nullify them, even if you could, even if you could get away with it, well, let's pass another one. Then you gotta go nullify that. State legislatures would be 24-7. It'd be like trying to repeal the national debt dollar by dollar. You can't do it. It is physically, I mean, the, the law of physics comes into play at some point in here, and we, we have space-time problems. You cannot, the weapons are not suited 
for the warfare that we need to fight. We've got to fight, you know, it's, it's like, remember the Indiana Jones movie? The big Egyptian with the sword? You don't want to get a sword fight with that guy. Especially you don't want to get a sword fight. He's got a sword and you've got a pocket knife. If you're going to fight him, you pull out your gun and shoot him in the gut. It's the only way to fight that kind of a scenario. And the only thing that we have got in our warfare is the Constitution itself and Article 5 in the Constitution. Nullification is a form of secession. That's all it is. And I don't believe as a Christian that we can go to war when we've got a weapon that's written into the Constitution and we're afraid to use the Constitution itself to defeat the tyrannical government in Washington, D.C. I don't believe that fear is ever a justification in the land of the free and the home of the brave to turning our backs on the Constitution itself and moving into this, this air, arena out of absolute abject fear. You're willing to go to war, but not willing, you're, you're not afraid of that? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't, you know, it ain't going to be pretty if we, if we ever go to war. It's not going to be pretty. But we're morally not in a position to do so. We need to use the Constitution itself. Why did they give us Article 5? George Mason said at the end of the, uh, the, the Constitutional Convention, there's going to be a day when this government abuses its authority. But when that day happens, you will not get the kind of amendments you need from that source, any Congress. It will never happen. You've got to have the states have the unilateral ability to put amendments into place to rein in the abuses of power by the federal government. That's exactly what George Mason said. And if we're not in that time today, we're never going to be in that time. We are in a day where the federal government has abused its power so badly that there's no other way to describe it other than utter tyranny. And there is no weapon that we have in our warfare can, that can fix the problem other than the, the Article 5 process. We have an amendment in place that says this. The general welfare clause shall not be construed as an independent authority for the expenditure of funds. The Congress may only spend funds for its enumerated powers in other clauses. And then you say, Congress may not dictate to the states domestic policy through federal grants. You do that, the general welfare clause goes away as a problem. And it basically have this rule. If the states can spend money on it, the federal government can't. Commerce Clause is the same thing. Commerce Clause was intended to give Congress the ability to regulate one thing and only one thing. Shipments across state lines. Not the manufacturing process. Look, let's take a General Motors plan. Congress should have no jurisdiction whatsoever under the Commerce Clause, if you interpret it correctly, 